Hello, this is Brett from Survival Comms. Today we're going to look at this device, which is the Law Enforcement Associate 6359 Tactical Repeater. Now, the minute many hear the term tactical, it generates this image of camo clad personnel kicking indoors, and this is an example of the power of marketing. I've made mention of this before in my Building Your Communications Plan series of my content catalog years ago. Tactical is nothing more than task accomplishment. You know, when you mow your yard, the way you accomplish that can be seen as lawn maintenance tactics, but I digress. This device is a crystal-tuned, internally duplex, self-powered VHF high-band FM radio repeater. Now, while it can be used for voice LAN mobile radio traffic, that isn't its intended primary application. Its intended use was to extend the range of legacy VHF FM wireless microphones for surveillance purposes. Now, one of these placed in an advantageous location gave the users of this gear the ability to distance themselves from the target to accomplish their task. Now the disadvantage to this was that anyone with a rudimentary knowledge of tactical surveillance countermeasures has a larger RF bubble for detection and compromise. So let's talk about the device itself. The device is contained in a Pelican case. We have a single BNC RF connector penetrating the case. We have a second case penetration that's for the external power and charging of the internal battery pack. So the device is very well protected from dust and moisture ingress. Now the device is currently inoperative and the missing power connector and the depleted internal battery necessitates changing that out first and getting that squared away before we can test it. So let's take a peek at the dashboard before we look under the hood. Let's take a tour of the controls of this device. Now this isn't intended to be a training video, but the device is so simple to operate that I feel the viewer will be able to deploy one of these devices effectively after watching this content. Starting at the 12 o'clock, retained by clamps, is a supplied helical duct antenna. This, or any other suitable VHF antenna, will be attached to the BNC RF port next to the handle. It is important to always either terminate the RF port in a load or antenna before turning the device on. Going clockwise, F1 is the main DC fuse for this device. The fuse is an AGC3. Next is a three position power control switch. Position one, the device is off and the charging pin will deliver current to the internal battery. Position 2 closes a circuit on the external DC pin and allows the device to be powered off of an external 12-volt DC source. Position 3 allows the device to power itself off of the internal battery. The internal batteries are two 6-volt SLA0925 gel cell batteries wired in series. Battery capacity is on the order of 6 to 7 amp hours. Next, we come to the squelch and volume control knobs. This repeater operates in a carrier squelch mode, and the squelch gate is rather loose in this device. A position of 3 to 5 o'clock allows the repeater to act as a repeater in the conventional sense. Any setting counterclockwise of that, the repeater transmitter remains keyed and passes the receive audio. In its use as a wireless microphone repeater, this is useful due to inherent ambiguity in received signal strength. The volume control controls the audio delivered to the headphone and audio RCA jack for recording monitoring equipment. This particular device wisely has these audio monitoring ports disconnected. There is little sense for a device operated concealed to out itself with audio. Next, we come to a location for a switch, which is for an optional speech inversion scrambler. This device is not equipped with such, and the slot is blocked off with a small aluminum plate. In the center, below the speaker, we see two lamps. The lamp on the left illuminates when the device is transmitting, and the lamp on the right illuminates whenever the device has power, regardless of transmitter state. Around the perimeter of the device, we have eight tamper-resistant screws, which we will remove to gain access to the device interior to replace the batteries. Now we see the inside of the device. On the left, we see our 2-watt transmitter. 
Many might sneeze at a 2 watt transmitter, but they shouldn't. 2 watts of RF at an advantageous location can have a considerable footprint, especially if you fe feed it into a decent antenna mounted to the device as there is zero feed line loss. And as you can see, the device is putting out a bit over 2 watts through the duplexer and cabling using a new internal battery. Remember, you are talking about a small device internally powered by a battery that needs to dissipate the heat produced by the transmitter. What kills radio coverage is poor receiver performance. Next are the controller boards. These control the intake, delivery, and distribution of DC power, the routing of audio from the receiver to the transmitter, transmitter keying, and routing of audio for local monitoring. Next is our receiver, and this is where the rubber meets the road. The receiver has to discern and process signals effectively and route them to the controller for transmission. A poor receiver or excessive receive system loss really compromises a repeater's terminal performance. It is important to protect our receiver from desensitization, and our next component, the duplexer, is what accomplishes that. In this device, we have a tiny, notch type four cavity duplexer. This duplexer is a tuned filter that notches out the transmitter frequency from the receiver side and notches out the receiver frequency from the transmitter side. This allows both devices to share a common antenna. And no, you cannot provide amateur 600 kilohertz separation in a device like this. This device operates on a bit over a five megahertz split. If interested in duplexer tuning, I have a how-to video in my content catalog. Now all this equipment is mounted to this aluminum stamping, and within it, between the front panel and the stamping, is a void for our batteries, which are going to change out. Now let's talk about the power connector on the outside. I'm not going to go through the trouble of trying to identify and acquire this plug. So in lieu of that, I have constructed this pigtail, with Molex pins, wire, heat shrink, and a power pole connector. When charging, I select the charging pin, and if I was to power the device off of DC externally, I select the external DC pin. Then I connect the power pole to my source of power, and it works great. Not as elegant as the factory connector, but it fills the gap. Well, now the device is squared away, I'm going to show you how easy it is to place one of these in service. It's simplicity in itself. So take your case, open it up, withdraw your antenna that's attached here, and you can hook it to a mag mount or whatever else you want to. Attach your antenna. Your squelch position, when you're going to use it for conventional radio repeater type traffic, just go ahead and put it in a 5 o'clock position there to keep it from falsing. This is a carrier squelch device after all. Now take your control here, rotate it to the battery location, and your standby light should illuminate. And if you open your squelch, you can see it's starting to pass traffic. Test 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And you can see our repeater light illuminate right here. And that's all there is to it. Close the device up. And you can set it up like this. Again, if you had it in a vehicle using a magnet mount antenna, you could even hoist one of these. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. Now, let's say you wanted to mount this to some kind of elevated support structure, like, say, for instance, a tree branch or something of that nature. You need to have a sufficiently sized tree branch to support the weight of this device. This device weighs about 11 pounds. So that's your first consideration. Your second is, is that you need to take and use a pulley in a hoisting line instead of just trying to take your throw line and hoist this up on that with parachute cord or something of that nature. That's not a good idea. You need to have some kind of a pulley. But if you want to do it, we also have some considerations for tying the device up with some cordage. And we'll talk about that right now. You're going to want to have a carabiner and a good quality carabiner, not some keychain carabiner. Go ahead and get yourself your line. Now we're going to go ahead and make a figure eight on a bite. Now take that and run that from back to front. 
run your line back all the way through and this makes a girth hitch and what's nice about that is if something happens with one of these latches this the tension on this knot here is going to help assist keeping this closed now on the other side you need to do the same thing and you could do that with a bowline if you chose to do so and a bowline is a fine knot for this it's something it's simple to untie that flips over and now we have an outside bowline and then through the top here coming from the back you're going to want to take and make another figure eight knot and then you can see how we can hoist our item and you're going to want to connect it to your hoisting line with a carabiner as such rhinoceros this is platypus i am marsupial at this time over I hope this helps. This is Brad from Survival Comms. Until next time.